All right, I'll hand it over to you, these wonderful people. Give them a big round of applause. All right. Ah, okay, so you guys are all here. I'm sure you, you know what this talk is. You should pat yourself on the back because this is the right choice for talk to attend right now. It is the best talk. You made the right decision. Your life is already done. You're good. You're good for life because uh, we're talking about Cisco routers and secure boot. Uh, and the title of this talk is 100 Seconds of Solitude. Uh, my name is Aung Tsui. I'm Jumping Is that on? Yeah. Is this thing on? Uh, hey, uh, my name is Jatin Gadaria. Very good, okay. And what is primary main objective? <laughs> primary main objective is not Chimpogo Camp. It is Cisco Trust Anchor. Uh, and you know, so this talk is about the work that we've done over the last three years uh, around reverse engineering not just the Cisco router uh, in front of you but uh, a fundamental piece of hardware that underpins a lot of the, the secure boot process of um, dozens of types of Cisco devices ranging from you know small switches all the way up to the very large enterprise level you know core router. So uh, the trust anchor is something that we had no idea it existed when we started this project and we'll take you through all of that story but um, Ultimately what this revolved around was the work that we developed, techniques that we developed uh, to manipulate FPGA bitstreams in order for it to do something useful. Uh, so, uh, you know, even though we're going to talk about the security implications of uh, our techniques on this router, uh, we're really here to talk, well, okay, so the deeper primary main objective is uh, FPGA bitstream manipulation. And the reason why this is is because, you know, yes, uh, Cisco routers and switches you know, all use or a lot of them use this type of uh, you know, Spartan, Xilinx, FPGA but so do a whole lot of other things in the world like, you know, uh, advanced driver assist in cars, uh, I'm sure legacy weapon systems, missiles and all sorts of things and the, uh, you know, the techniques that we're going to talk about here are going to affect those devices too so even though this might seem like a fairly large impact vulnerability disclosure, uh, the real impact of using these techniques uh, in devices we haven't even started to look at uh, I think is much larger. So, uh, you know, like I said we did this for three years uh, and there's a long story which I'm going to take you through over the next 235 slides. And yes I have exactly those. Uh, and but before we start, you know, this is a kind of an epic story, you know, there's love and loss and betrayal, more love and friendship and defeat and, you know, redemption and, and more friendship. Uh, so we're going to go through the cast. Uh, Jaden over here, right, that's him. Uh, Rick is actually in the front row, that's Rick. Joey is sadly not here, I think he's at a wedding. Uh, this is me, I'm wearing sandals just like the photo shows. James, uh, right there, okay. And um, well, over the last three years uh, at Rebel and Security, we've invested a ton of our resources in creating this massively complicated, highly intelligent automated testing framework uh, abbreviated to Brian. You know, it's so complicated that some might even say that he is borderline sentient, <laughs> which I think is ridiculous, but you know, we'll, we'll get to that. All right, so as with uh, all great epic tales, uh, we start in mid story. Okay, so you know we started this work in 2016. Uh, in 2015, Jad and I worked on this little thing where we got code execution inside the on screen display controllers of all sorts of, you know, probably over a billion monitors. Uh, and then in 2017, you know, Rick and I worked on this thing where we built an EMP, uh, electromagnetic pulse generator, in order to defeat Secure Boot in Trust Zone on a Cisco phone. So, you know, those projects were pretty simple, straightforward, you know, there's really no thinking involved, I mean, very easy to do. Uh, so in the middle of all of that, you know, I say, hey guys, like, our lives are so easy, you know, like, it's going too well, uh, let's punish ourselves for, like, no reason. And then Jaden says. What the F, man? Why? <laughs> he says, you what? Right? So ultimately, you know, fast forward to 2019, here we are talking about all of that work. Uh, and, you know, it resulted in this thing called Thrangry Cat, right? And technically, you can't pronounce it like Thrangry Cat because it is the first vulnerability named after three unpronounceable emojis. So you can only come close to pronouncing it, but not really, you can't really say it out loud. Uh, Thrangry Fact 1. Uh, the domain name for this vulnerability is emojis, okay? And for uncool kids, you can type it out as Thrangry Cat, it's fine. Uh, Thrangry Fact 2, we, you know, have all sorts of information about the nature of the vulnerability, you know, how we did it. And actually, I will tempt fate and 
try to tab out of this thing to show you our website. So if you go to our website, uh, just a few hours ago, you know, we put the slides up finally and then we also have all of the libraries that we'll be talking about and the tools that we built. Uh, it's all in GitHub. It's right there on our website. So if you like any of this stuff and you're interested, check it out. The tools are actually super cool. Okay. So we wrote about, you know, we had this like four, uh, rationale, you know, four series, a set of four reasons why we decided to name, uh, our vulnerability after emojis. Uh, and I'll just give you one. Rule, uh, reason number two is that emojis are indexical to the digital age. Right? And uh, that's just one of four reasons. And Thrangry Fact 2.1, and this made my heart sing when I read it, right? I found it interesting that the section that explains the name of this vulnerability is way more thought out and verbose than any other sections. It's almost they had like a linguist on the team and the emoji name was his prideful contribution. True fact. True fact. I, thank you. If you're out there, you're good. Um, all right, so just the immediate impact of uh, this vulnerability, uh, it affected, like I said, probably I, th I think something like 180 uh, types of. 133. 133 Cisco devices, and here's a list of some of them. You know, it goes like this page, and more on this page, and 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 this page. I think there's one more. Nope, two more, one more, right? All right, cool. So it affects a whole lot of Cisco routers. All right, let's talk about how we did it. Uh, you know, so. It all started when we wanted to um, hack ASR 1001. But it was end of life, and uh, Cisco started, uh, you know, sending 1001 X in 2013. Right? Yeah. So right, John was like, "Let's look at the 1001," and I was like, "Oh, we can't really buy this thing anymore." So whatever, I see this thing called 1001 X. Uh, whatever. Let's. It's probably the same, you know. Yeah, but uh, what uh, doesn't matter. We don't care about the documentation. Who care about the X? You know, X it, is for chumps. It's probably fine, right? <laughs> so we looked at it. We, you know, signed ourselves up to to do this work, and you know, to, to be fair, look, the left is the 1001, the right is the 1001 X. Looks exactly the same. Uh, you know, the 1001 X uh, was kind of expensive. It's like eleven thousand dollars per router, but we bought it anyway to v help everyone visualize what exactly that is. It's on sale, though. Huh? It was on sale. Oh, that's right. It's on sale. So you can get it for a little bit cheaper. Uh, anyway, so what is that? Let's talk about what that means. So $1 is uh, 6.14 inches by 2.61 inches. It's approximately 1 gram. So the cost of that 1001X is approximately 3.58 3 feet or 22 pounds, which uh, to put in a unit that you guys can understand, it's basically two healthy three month old babies stacked on top of each other. Like that's the right height and weight. That's exactly what it is. Okay? So the uh, 1001 X, the X uh, has this thing called Trust Anchor and Secure Boot, which again at the time we had no idea what it is. Uh, so we thought, hey, maybe this is just like a new bootloader, whatever. Let's, we can do it. All right. So, Goal is uh, what do we want to do? The goal is to modify the Raman. Like we just wanted to run our own firmware, our own stack on the ASR 1001, and it was that's what we wanted. So uh, we have done you know previous work, and we thought you know like it will be easy. It will just like change the root key, change the firmware. It doesn't matter. Let's just do that. All right. So and the, this is kind of like Iron Chef. The secret ingredient is okay. We actually have one of these things in front of you, and if I don't knock it over the table, we'll see what's inside. If we don't keep the lid on, uh, it'll, the thermals are horrible, so it's not great. But anyway, so when you open this box, uh, you see this thing over here. Uh, it might look a little weird, but a lot of this is basically a standard, you know, Intel based computer, right? So the things that we care about is, um, you know, obviously there is the Intel Xeon processor, so probably a lot of that code runs there. Uh, and uh, there is a Xilinx FPGA, so who knows, maybe that's doing something interesting. And this thing has a number of different little FPI, uh, SPI flash chips that uh, we thought might actually be, you know, useful to look at. Uh, and the rest of it is a whole lot of complicated hardware that actually makes, you know, the routing and switching stuff work. But, you know, we opened this box and we said, okay, you know, we probably understand something about this uh, piece of hardware, you know, this is somewhat like a normal pro a computer, but it certainly has a whole lot of weird stuff that we haven't seen before. Okay, so let's look at the software analysis. Um, so if you guys have worked with Cisco, they used to have uh, this uh, proprietary boot console called Ramon, so which allows you to boot through TFTP, you know, 
change images. Uh, so what they did was they changed to UEFI in 2013 and uh, but they still wanted to work with their Raman. So they implemented a pre-Raman as a pre-EFI module. What it does is that it manages Raman. It also with those two SPI flashes as you saw as you can see it also handles the updates. So in the Linux kernel if they want to apply a patch to the bootloader the Linux kernel will update one of the SPI flashes and then the pre-Raman will validate uh, that whether it is right or not and if it is not then copy the code and copy again. Uh, pretty common stuff. Uh, then they had Ra uh, then they had Raman and uh, basically this is implemented as a DXE module. Uh, again it does the exactly same thing. It can allow you to boot uh, uh, Cisco images um, through TFTP. Also allows, also validates the next o operating system it's going to boot in the bootload um, the uh, OS stage. And uh, it also has a privilege mode which allows you to uh, introspect what is happening in the DXE. Oh, by the way, so ROM doesn't stand uh, for what you think it does. It's not actually read only memory, it stands for romantic monitor. True <laughs> fact. True fact. <laughs> So uh, then comes the Linux kernel. Uh, so they ported, uh, they started using, uh, you know, uh, um, off the shelf Linux kernel on which they ported their own Cisco stack running uh, as a privileged process. They also wrote a process manager which uh, manages this process. So anything, any kind of crash happens in the iOS, it reboots the whole uh, system. And once you combine this, this becomes your iOS XE stack. And if you go to their website, this is the most secure stack. Uh, so we, while doing this analysis, looking at everything, we s saw no hashes on the UEFI, no certs on the UEFI, so it should be like a really m easy mod because our goal is to just run our own stack. And uh, we also disabled uh, some of the checks um, which were in the pre-Raman and we mod uh, booted the modified firmware and everything worked. And I was, this is pretty simple. Uh, so, but, wait, then router reset. Then we saw like wow it reset after every hundred seconds which doesn't make sense and uh, we spent a lot of time. Well and so then first I it was uh, you know it, it, you know it resets well he was able to get code execution on the Xeon processor and it allowed us to do it and then you would eventually kind of reboot and then uh, at first you know he was like well it boots once in a while maybe a minute right and yeah. then he was like ah, it's kind of like a hundred seconds and yeah. I say well how many seconds? Exactly 100 seconds? Because computers don't like to count in decimal, you know, it's not like they have 10 fingers and 10 toes. <laughs> so 100 exact seconds yeah. was kind of a hint to us that there's something else uh, that's kind of like a, you know, piece of code that some engineer wrote that enforces that 100 second thing. So this is signified by a loud fan noise. These fans, as you can see, four fans, make a very loud noise and this was crucial in doing all of the reverse engineering. This is probably the key the fan noise. So we came up with the hypothesis of like what is this 100 second reset causing? You know there are multiple x86 because the RAR processor is an x86 core. So maybe there are multiple mitigations like the one is the, you know maybe it is doing some kind of virtual machine introspection. Uh, but we analyzed the code, it was already disabled. Uh, x86 has dozens of wash talk timers so we disabled all of them because we had 100 seconds to run whatever code we want. And uh, that also did not help. Uh, then we went to SMM and we saw like SMM was enabled, uh, so we disabled that, uh, but it was still pre booting. So I was like, um, I don't know, well, man. Yeah, How so we, we hypothesized like, is there like a magical deity in this processor that somehow, despite the fact that we control every instruction that executes on the processor, still is watching us and tempting us, right? It allows us to execute, like, our hopes are coming true. Right, and it waits for 100 seconds before it takes our dream away. Right, like what kind of thing is this? Ugh. All right, so you know, normally every time we ask this question, we're like, how do we mind read the computer we don't understand? Uh, we typically like to default back to electromagnetic emanation. And if you look at some of the past research we, we've done, this is a really useful tool uh, and a way to kind of figure out, you know, what the computer is kind of doing without really understanding a lot. So, you know, basic stuff like when you push an electron through a wire, right, it likes to induce a magnetic field, then electric field, so it kind of emanates, right, EM. So when you take a near field probe to the thing, right, you should be able to measure out the, uh, you know, activity around certain parts of the, the machine in order to kind of come out with a timeline of what is probably executing. So, you know, we have a CNC machine that we like to hook up to a near field probe, right, that to do this type of, you know, analysis automatically. Uh, I think the, the zip tie broke so we're just holding it by hand. But usually it's automated. Uh, we, we swear. <laughs> right? So, 
uh, after gathering some data, here's what we have. Okay, so uh, on this one, on the, on the way, way on the right, we have uh, the emanation coming out of the, the CPU power supply. Okay, so there is a tiny little dot, uh, where's my mouse? Up here, right? So this is, uh, you know, time, right? Uh, so, you know, as we go downwards, that's later in time. So little dots come up, right, and a whole lot of uh, noise coming out of the power supply, you know, in like a quarter second or something like that. Now, uh, there's nothing coming out of the, uh, the CPU, the Xeon processor, until basically the bottom of, of, of this graph. So the processor is sitting idle doing nothing. But the FPGA, the Xeon Spartan 6 FPGA, has this uh, emanation profile. So, you know, a, a slightly after the initial power turn on, right, you see two little blips and then it waits there for a while, thinks about its life and then uh, later it starts doing a bunch of stuff, right? And then the SPI chip, one of the SPI chips which is actually connected to the FPGA, right, has similar uh, electromagnetic emanation profile uh, in the beginning and then, you know, it, it gets red and then basically nothing happens. So, you know, if you put like, this is like blues clues, right, you put all these clues together, I wonder what's happening. So, power turns on, right, the FPGA reads from the SPI uh, flash, uh, its bitstream, right, it actually reads two bitstreams and then it loads that configuration into the FPGA and then the FPGA does some magical thing, right, and then basically at the very bottom of this, this is where the uh, the, the Xeon processor starts to do stuff. So, uh, you know, we start hypothesizing that this is basically the mean little deity that's hiding in the machine that's taking our dreams away after 100 seconds. You took my joke. Alright. <laughs> oh. But, um, there is a slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there were unknown bits coming out of this SPI. Uh, and, uh, we saw, you know, like it was not available in the bootloader and turned out, uh, we had 100 seconds so we can dump this code. Uh, and, uh, these were interrupt handlers, uh, for the real mode. Uh, basically the BIOS, ROM, VBIOS, which is present in that range. Uh, then we also, you know, analyzed, we saw some uh, address ranges which was like uh, 0xfe d4 as you can see. This is usually used for external devices uh, which are mapped, uh, uh, you know, memory mapped as um, IO devices uh, for SQI's, you know, bus which is basically a serial quad interface. And uh, once you, once this also gives us like kind of an idea like some other IO device is mapped in and x86 is uh, uh, reading its state. So just to validate we also hijacked the first x86 instruction, wrote the whole serial driver, literally validated and there was an external entity which was doing it and that was a joke. But. Well, wait, hold on. <laughs> so this is where, you know, he put it in the slide and I said, well, you know, let's not be culturally insensitive. So I added, we do have a cat god in the rest of this presentation, so cat Buddha. Cat Buddha, Cat Buddha. So <laughs> there is a deity. Uh, it is a vengeful one. So uh, we wanted to, um, you know, we knew that uh, FPGA is doing the reset. Um, so this was our assumption at this point. Like FPGA is booting, uh, it's validating the UEFI. So any bit change in the UEFI uh, sp address space, uh, you know, it causes the whole thing to uh, reset. And also pre ROM on checks ROM on, ROM on checks Linux OS. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, secure boot flow. So then we wanted to find the reset pin and uh, uh, it was the first $10,000 device which we did because it was a BGA chip. Well and so, and this is a large part of the difficulty of doing this work because, I mean seriously, who can afford to just blow away $10,000 by like touching a pin wrong, you know, th that was for all of us uh, and we've destroyed many more than just one of these. Uh, so this was uh, for all of us probably the most expensive soldering mistake we've made in life until this point. So in, in honor of those mistakes we've built a fail fort, right? So the, the fort grows over time and there's a whole history and mythology about the rise and fall of fail fort. But anyway, fail fort version one, $10,000, uh, humble beginnings. This is the start of the civilization. Um, then uh, we wanted to test this theory, right? Uh, and RTL reconstruction is really hard and we'll come back to article, uh, RTL, what is RTL? And then, uh, but we still wanted it and uh, uh, I want just like to pull the reset pin high and I'm a systems guy so I go to either Ong or Rick for my hardware problems and uh, Rick said, you know, this GI Joe guy over there, like <laughs> I'm going to take a 10K ohm uh, resistor and I'm going to just, you know, keep it high always. And then it again costed it basically costed one dollar per one ohm and it was total cost was twenty. Alright, so now router sitting there doing like completely unfazed except you know the ones that have died. Uh and us were negative twenty thousand uh, dollars in a in a hole. So version two, you know, we started racing 
recklessly yeah. towards this sales is, guy. This is where we, uh, you know, took over the temple which Ang built. Um, <laughs> All right, so you know, at this time, and another one of our colleagues, you know, uh, Joey was sitting and saying, "Well, man, why are you guys like?" breaking all this equipment, you guys suck, like why don't you try to Google this, you know? And he said like I'm a level 9 Googler, so look I type into the computer thing and I found this patent. So here is a patent uh, awarded to Cisco in 2012 that talked about a lot of the things that we were kind of seeing, right? So it is a patent on secure boot through an external device and it's ex specifically said, you know, you can implement this using an FPGA and it actually has a very similar diagram to the thing that we came up with. So anyway, this document super useful and one key thing that the document said is you must implement the trust anchor, which is I think what they called it in this patent, with an immutable uh, thing, right? Because if the attacker can like change it, then the whole the premise of it goes away. Uh, and they also said that you can implement it with an FPGA. But you know, we'll get back to that. Also, uh, wait. So it is also, if you see, it is connected through LPC bus. So the way it is actually doing it is like it turns off the South Bridge. So the, re uh, the code has to just reset. All right. So at this point, you know, we can, we're kind of getting somewhere. But, you know, for, for us and I think for a whole lot of other folks out there, you know, we're firmware people, you know, maybe software people maybe some hardware people but all of us found FPGAs to be scary. You know, it is a mystery thing that's really hard. A lot of smart people are working on it and uh, you know, they haven't done the thing that we needed. So, you know, we kind of, you know, said, ugh, this is so hard. And we said, well, you know what, like why don't we stop, let's give up but say we didn't. And then like a year goes by, right, because uh, you know, we have actual work and you know, we already defeated twice, like twenty thousand dollars in the hole. Um, and then, you know, one night, Jaden was like, "Yeah, I, I basically went to Ang and I said, like, give me twenty thousand dollars more. <laughs> let's do it. So <laughs> I can, I can hack FPGA. Yeah. And I said, okay, fine, let's go do it. So uh, he read a ton of docs and he's going to talk about. Yeah. So uh, again, as, as I said, like I'm a systems guy. So you know, how do you understand FPGAs? And uh, wait, so actually, we, we never. What is an FPGA? What does yeah. it stand for? So what is an FPGA, right? Like it looks like a lot of blocks, a lot of registers, a lot of flip flops. Well, no idea. Field programmable gate array. Oh, I see. Yeah. I still don't know that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how does the FPGA design flow works, right? Like uh, the coder basically provides the hardware circuit and an SGA hardware description language. Uh, the vendor toolchain synthesizes it, places it, maps it, all this information about the truth tables, about what is the memory initialization, routing, and so forth, uh, gets encoded into a bit stream, which gets encoded into a binary, which we call it a configuration bit stream. So anytime FPGA gets configured, how the, uh, you know, because it is an IC which has b uh, benefits of both hardware and software, uh, so it has hardware logic block to implement, to do computations, and so, um, it can be reconfigured as software. And there are different types of FPGAs. There is SRAM based FPGA, which is basically boots uh, its configuration bit stream from an external static memory. Uh, so anytime it reboots, it has to reload itself, and that's what we are talking about here uh, for Cisco ASR. And then the other one is the flash base, in which the flash is automatic, uh, is already present on the die. It's less power consumption. It uh, boots really quickly. And then the other one is the anti fuse, which is doesn't allow you to configure again. So it's not kind of an FPGA. So but still what is FPGA? Now, now we learn about yeah. advanced FPGA because we're that's learning how smart we are. FPGA. Yeah. And beginning FPGA and I just learned field program of gate array. Okay. And actually you still didn't know what <laughs> FPGA stands for. It's good. So FPGA can be thought of, think of as like a combination of blocks. You know, each block does something and they basically correlate with each other. But again, what is FPGA for systems people? It's Y is equal to FX. So this is very important because what matters is like if we can control the Y and the X with ir irrespective of the logic F, then we win. Doesn't matter how complex it is. So let's go inside like what are the basic blocks of the FPG. IOB is a group of basic elements which drives uh, the output and the input functions of the FPG and the value could be 0, 1 or Z. But really what is it? It is just a thing which is connected to IO pin and it gives 0 or 1. That's all you care about. The second thing is IO interface. This is how the pin gets the va uh, uh, the value from the rest of the logic and provides value to the re uh, to the other part of the logic. And the third is BRAM, which is just memory. It can be of different data width. Uh, you know, it could be one bit, uh, one width or two or 32, or it could be uh, for Spartan 6, it's like 18 kilobyte, 9 kilobyte blocks. You can configure it. You can make it uh, single or dual port. 
The other uh, which does uh, so complex logic block is something which implements the boolean function of the FPGA. It has two slices, a switch matri matrix. Switch matrix allows it to con uh, you know like communicate with rest uh, rest of the FPGA or also allows it to communicate it to other parts of the IO. Uh, and uh, it, the slice contains flip flops and you again doesn't matter for system scrap. Uh, and then there is, you know, slices can be of multiple types, slice X, Boolean function, slice L with the carry logic, Boolean function, and slice M also allows, gives you some memory. Uh, but this is the complexity of the FPGA. It's Do I so complicated. I'm, I'm bored just I know. listening to this. I right? Because there's so many, you know, like little nuances of piece of, like all of the stuff and all of the inners of this is a, Almost always in commercial FPGA is kept as a secret. This is a proprietary thing. You know, they allow you to, they give you a toolchain that generates, you know, from the, the Harvard description language, the bitstream that configures their specific vendor specific, you know, FPGA and it will work, but they don't actually, they will generally never tell you the, any of the internals of how that bitstream is read and what it, what that bit actually does. But, you know, you have to know all of this stuff about the components and you kind of match up just, depend on the fact that the magical tool chain will give you the bitstream that will magically configure this hardware thing to do what you kind of told it to do through, you know, VHDL or Verilog. So uh, other resources doesn't really matter, leave it. So what is the developer domain, right? The developer domain is like you specify the source code and the attacker domain is the bitstream. So how do you reverse a bitstream? Well, let, before that, let's go back, right? So as an attacker, you know, you don't have access to any of the information about the hardware description language. You don't actually even know the, how the, the various blocks are routed. All you have is this, you know, end of the result bitstream, like literally a stream of bits that is fed through the FPGA uh, and magically, like I said, you know, that bitstream makes the FPGA do what you think it should do. Uh, but as a, an attacker, uh, all you have is the bitstream, so you have to reverse engineer the bitstream, you know, like you would reverse engineer a piece of binary with the uh, machine instructions, and then figure out, you know, what the logical constructs is in that massive bitstream without any documentation from the vendor. And again, you know, each vendor will have a different format, right? Each type of class of uh, FPJ from the same form uh, vendor will have a different format. So the rules are literally changing on you uh, underneath your feet, uh, and that's what we have. Okay, so um, so right. we wanted to reverse the FPGA, right? And uh, there is some people have tried it. JBits was one thing which uh, Xilinx released in 1999. It allowed you to like change logic, uh, but then they start stopped uh, uh, supporting it. Then Build, which it requires a netlist. It was released in 2012, and the guy did say that it's very it's like impossible to reverse engineer. And then 2017 Bitmare, it also allows you to like move logic, relocate logic. Um, so by reversing, you know, we mean you take the bitstream and then the goal for the most part is to be able to re recover the uh, hardware description language and underlying logic that went into generating that bitstream and once you have that and if you did that 100% correctly, uh, you might be able to modify that logic to have it do something different than its original design and then you have to run the whole synthesis tool, right, and regenerate the bitstream, well, you know, to redo the optimization routing and then regenerate a bitstream and if you did that 100% correctly, again without knowing any of the rules about how those bits are actually used uh, for that FPGA, uh, then you might have a hope of, you know, taking something like the bitstream that we found in the FPGA that we think is implementing the trust anchor and then altering its behavior in a way that it might allow us to bypass, you know, the trust anchor capability. But the, the chances, you know, people doing this on anything but a very simple FPGA, uh, it's very low. In fact, I, I'm not actually aware of anyone who has successfully done that entire path on something like a commercial, uh, you know, like a, you know, a real world commercial uh, application of an FPGA uh, you, on some commercial, you know, bitstream. So, so let's chances that working, very low. Yeah, let's talk about the pipe. Okay. All right. So, like I mentioned, you know, on the FPGA, you have uh, complex logic blocks, right? So this is where, you know, your hardware uh, description language with the logic gets uh, configured. Then you have pins, right? Pins are literally those little metal things that stick out from the chip, right, that you wire to other metal things on other chips. So, you know, we're humans, we like to design things on, you know, a few layers of a PCB, right? So the number of pins uh, we want to keep reasonable and the largest, uh, you know, Spartan 6 uh, FPGA has something like 560, 76 pins, right? So, you know, that's a lot but that's a very small finite number compared to the logic blocks. Uh, which go up to about 200,000. And in each block you have a whole lot of, uh, you know, like sm smaller logic blocks. So, you know, 
we have about no more than 600 pins and we have 200,000 CLBs and you know, standard sort of uh, approach to FPGA reversing was to you know recover all of the logic from all the CLBs and we looked at that and we said well you know we're not FPGA people like we're you know this is too complicated right like this probably won't work uh, a lot of smart people have tried and haven't really gotten far but why would why don't we look at this you know there're not that many pins so if we can figure out a way to uh, deterministically and reliably uh manipulate the pin who cares about what the logic is doing you know if we can disconnect the pin right and hook it up to something else that we supply then it's one of those things of like if the FPGA falls in the forest like did it really happen if no one hears it? No, right? Because uh you know if we take a pin, disconnect it from its logic uh and that pin is still connected to the rest of the circuit board and then we've bypassed that logic, right? So uh and this is an actual plot of the Spartan 6 family. The largest uh, no most uh, dense chip uh has yeah 576 pins and 150,000 logic blocks, right? So if you put that you know actually in scale, the graph actually looks like something like this, right? So, and this is not even to scale. That curve grows really fast. So, one of our intuitions at the beginning is forget about reconstructing, you know, rec reconstructing logic, uh, it's too hard. Let's look at, you know, a way for us to reliably manipulate the pen itself and see if we can do that. So, also, uh, you know, Bistrom does com uh, optimizations and there are no optimizations in the IOB. This is uh, one of the logic uh, complexity we are looking at. So, this is a SHA 256 we wrote, and uh, this is a very small part of that logic. It has like thousands of CLEs. Uh, but what is interesting is this thing, right? Like, it, this is the binary representation of the bit the top part represents the complex logic block which is implementing the boolean functions and the uh, seven or yeah six of those are basically the IOB blocks. Each IOB blocks is eight bytes in Spartan 6. And if you uh, con can control, if you change a little bit in this, you know like a byte here, you can change the value of the logic uh, of the IOB from zero to one or one to zero. And you can uh, you can also change these eight bytes represents the characteristics of this IOB. So you can convert it from uh, uh, you know, like input to output. By just changing one parameter, the number of rounds in the SHA-256 look at the logic changing, but the IOB remains the same. And this is the diff. So the only diff was actually in the complex logic block. It was not there in the IOB. And this is very important. So as well, I actually, said, let, let's back. So the thing that you're looking at is an actual uh, graphical rendering of the actual bitstream generated from this little mock example that we created. Uh, and if you can go back one more slide, right? Yeah. So the IOB doesn't change at all. It's in very predictable places. We know where the pins are because they're numbered, you know, one after another, right? They are uh, designed on the PC board and they don't get to change because the PC board is, uh, you know, in hardware. And if we figured out like which 8 byte construct um, describes which pin, then we should be able to very predictably and reliably, uh, you know, change the behavior of that pin uh, and we have a much more hope of doing that than trying to do RTL reconstruction on the logic block. Okay, so as we said, like uh, we can change the output from uh, to uh, you know we can assign the value zero without depending on the fun uh, the function f. Uh, then similarly, output to one, change output to input, uh, and the same thing goes with the input. So uh, what we want to say here is that like you know the vendor is not vendor should not be dependent on the obscurity of the FPGA because as we saw RTL reconstruction is hard but not changing IO. So how do you reverse a bitstream? Right? We see bitstream as a firmware and it can go with unpack, analyze, modify, repack. And it has you can talk about like it has encryption but you can probably do uh, you know like uh side channel analysis to figure out the AES keys, you know you can do fault injection to change to basically skip this check and then you can also do photon emotion and analysis. Uh, so our development board which we chose to do all this research was Spartan 6 uh, LX45T uh, uh, is the model of the Spartan. And how do you do on the unpack? If you read the documentation you can do the unpack. Uh, which is basically like find the sync word, figure out which uh, kind, what kind of um, uh, Spartan it is, uh, download it, uh, register in the description language, parse it and uh, find the registered FDRI which specifies the hardware circuit for Boolean functions. So uh, then we move to analyze. There are multiple types of logic, uh, uh, type zero pa uh, frames. The first one is the uh, complex logic block frame, which and also it contains IOI, uh, um, you know, like how to configure a BRAM and all that. 
Type 1 is BRAM, the actual memory, what it contains. Uh, and the type 2 is the IOB itself. And all of these, which is very important, is all of these are serially laid out. So if you figure out the range of, uh, of each of those, then you can do analysis and reversing to figure out which uh, pin is represented by which bits. And you know, um, the main important thing here is like, if you figure out the device layout, you can exactly pinpoint which CLB is used, which BRAM is used, and which IOB is used. And each, you know, these are details which you can find in our uh, GitHub. Uh, and uh, major represents so it is a two uh, SRAM is basically a 2D uh, array, and uh, each row has multiple columns. Each column represent one resource. So you know, like a CLB, a memory uh, slice MCLB will be one column, slice LCLB will be second column, BRAM will be third column, and like that. And similarly, each, each column has its own array of rows, uh, which defines which flip flop is used, uh, uh, which MUX was actually uh, encoded. So uh, we we actually analyzed the bitstream and created this really cool uh, visualization. My team has really worked hard on this uh, tool. Uh, as you can see, it specifies the resource utilization, uh, which column is used. You can see this is for uh, the Mojo board, uh, which uses LX9. It's a really cool dev board, and this represents the ASR bitstream. So you you can see like which uh, uh, block, which resource represents the PCIe, which resource represents the LCLB, and so forth and so, so on. So this tool, can you go back, is, is on GitHub right now. It's amazingly cool. You should totally check it out. Because, uh, you know, you can, all that stuff that Jaden said, you can read maybe 2,000 pages of Xilinx documentation and try to figure it out. Great. Or you can use this tool which has already done that. And not only that, it will show you, like, every, you can pinpoint to any piece of the binary and it will show you what that binary, wh what that chunk of binary represents. Is it an IO pin? If so, which pin is it? Right? Is it like a CLB? If so, like what is the raw data in that CLB? Uh, and for us, you know, we, after reading the, the patent, knew that, okay, the trust anchor does a whole lot of magical deity stuff, right? And then if it doesn't like what's happening after 100 seconds, it will literally assert the reset pin on the Xeon processor and physically reset the processor. So that is how the mechanism we think worked. So if we can find out exactly which pin uh, the FPGA is using, uh, for that, we can do our thing and disable that pin and make sure the trust anchor literally cannot reset that reset pin, and then we win. And uh, the next thing is okay, so because the pins are set in, in serially, uh, in serial order, uh, we know exactly what part of that binary it ought to be. So the only thing that we need to know now is which pin uh, actually is used on that FPGA, which basically involves tracing, you know, the, the PCB on this router from the CPU reset pin to the FPGA, which is very simple. Um, we have only five minutes left, so I guess we're going to go to the demo, but uh, this is how the encoding works. If you know the range, figure out how, which pin represent, which bit represent which pin, and uh, you know, all this code you can easily read. Yeah, um, we have a paper coming out in Woot, we have a lot of documentation in GitHub, all the details are there. And um, one thing I would want to say is that modification is really easy. Uh, they have like implemented this 22 bit CRC for single event upset, you know, uh, and uh, that is also reverse engineered. You guys can just check out the GitHub. You really have to go. But uh, you can also disable the CRC. I haven't tried that. But uh, you can just disable using this register. Uh, and then I want to, uh, the demo basically contains, uh, we have a bitstream which enables those four pins, and we're going to, just turn this pin off uh, using the tool, which is currently present again. And uh, as Ang said, we basically figured out which is the reset, uh, which pin is re controlling the reset pin, and you disable that. And really cool thing part about this is, like, uh, uh, there is no patch available. Once it is allowed, we disable the emulation of the FPGA so that the Linux code actually cannot update the FPGA anymore. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, and uh, I also want to talk about uh, Rick uh, found a really cool way as Ang was saying like there are 600 pins. In this case there were 296 and you know our uh, automated extraction bitstream tool who is not here right now. Uh, so he, he came up with a cool idea of JTAG scan chain. Uh, as soon as the fan comes up uh, he checks the state of all of those 296 pins using JTAG and we found 10 pins. And one of them was the one. And you want Sure. Okay. So this is where Brian comes in. You know, we, after years of investing in this, uh, we just couldn't make it work. So we got an intern. His name is Brian. And I said, Brian, you touch all the pins, you find out where this thing connects. And he did it. 
He's great. Thank you, Brian. I mean, without him, this work would have not been possible because, you know, we need to trace through like the six uh, layers of the PCB in order to find, you know, which pin goes from the reset pin to the FPGA. Uh, and then, well, you know, he touched the wrong pins. So, feel for it. <laughs> Gross, right? It was just fine. I mean, it was a very hard job. So, uh, but then, you know, we were able to make some progress uh, and we were able to find that pin, right? Uh, and the last question is, well, this is cool, but how are we going to do this remotely? You know, if it's not remote, it's not really interesting uh, it, because if somebody already has root uh, on the router, then okay, you can change all sorts of stuff. So we said, well, you know, it's 2019, finding a remote, you know, code execution volume and then privilege es escalation has got to be really hard. I mean, people have been looking at Cisco routers for quite a long time. Uh, so, man, so like, do we, can we even do it? Uh, yeah, so they have a driver basically, that's how they use it. And uh, we also did a lot of fuzzing on all these protocols. Uh, while this was going on, James, come well, in. Well, you know, so we were like, man, this is going to be really hard. Who knows if we're ever going to get this to work? And then James, who's sitting over there, said, okay, guys, I got root. <laughs> it was great. And then, you know. Lua is easy, you know, like he found uh, command injection vulnerability, CSRF vulnerability on the Cisco routers, uh, which are passionate. So out. let's just point that out, you know, he found this KCAS remotely exploitable, uh, you know, command injection in 2019 on, a, on Cisco IOS. So, you know, for those who say that the command injections are gone, it's like, you know, it's not true. Uh, and this was a very simple uh, vulnerability to exploit. So, man, uh, this was great. So, if you couple any kind of code injection on any part of the attack surface of any Cisco IOS, uh, you know, platform or device that's affected by this, you can immediately use that escalate privilege and then update the firmware. Uh, and, well, update the, the bitstream and then disable the, the FPGA, right? The trust anchor. So, you can take a, a remote exploit, couple it with this, and make permanent modification of the hardware that is impossible to undo uh, using software again. So with that, let's um, and we broke some more uh, and then final cost fifty thousand uh, dollars. The fort is very large. Uh, but as a result, we figured, finally figured this out. So I'm going to let John show the, uh, the two demos. Uh, we're going to exploit the Cisco router and then show how this is done and then um, we're going to also show the, the mojo board demo. Uh, okay, so um So this is what I want to show right now. This is booted. It takes like 10 minutes to boot, so I had to boot it. So this is what the is output of this ASR 1001X right here, right? It's running the latest firmware. Well, one minus the latest firmware because Cisco did patch this. So what I want to talk about here is that, uh, look at this message. As soon as it boots, it says initializing hard hardware. And, uh, that says system integrity status. This status is coming from the FPGA. And the pre-ROM on, which we talked about earlier, is reading the status and printing it out. So, now we're gonna go ahead and exploit it. Fuck. <laughs> did we connect the wire? We did. Yeah, we did. We connected to the wrong port. <laughs> uh, one second. Oh, really? Yep. Anyhow, never mind. Uh, We Sorry meant to guys. do this. This is part of the demo. Okay. Well, Yay. okay, it's demo going done. on. So, what it is doing right now is that it is doing James Hack, uh, getting the root, and then we t uh, took a driver which was quack.ko. I don't know why they wanted to quack it. But, uh, so we took, we hijacked the driver, we understood this, we reverse engineered the CPLD driver, understood how to emulate, uh, how the FPG emulates the SPI, uh, flash for the, uh, Linux, uh, OS, and then, uh, basically applied the patch. You only require around 15 bytes of patch to disable the complete, uh, update and also disable the reset. This is gonna take some time. I'm gonna go ahead and, like, do the so Mojo demo. Just we're, what we're watching is a full remote exploit of Cisco IOS uh, followed by a full modification of Bitstream bypassing Trust Anchor and then permanently disabling any future updates to Trust Anchor via the FPGA with this Bitstream, uh, you know, modification. So, that being said, right, look at all, think about all of the devices that's affected. This thing has been in deployment since 2013. 
uh, this vulnerability is in all of those devices. So if anyone finds any code, uh, any kind of code execution on any part of that, that attack surface, uh, there's a chance that this is not only has affected your router but is persistent uh, to the point where in order for you to get rid of it, you probably will literally have to desolder a, a chip right from your router or your switch in order to test even to see if you've been exploited or not. Um, okay. So, uh, as you can see, this is a mojo board. Uh, well. and yeah, can you put the light on it? Yeah. So this is a mojo board. You will Google it. And uh, what matters is like those four lights, right? And uh, those four lights are representing one on those pins. And we're gonna go ahead, run our tool. So I'm gonna run again. Well, so right now, you know, the lights indicate, you know, the pieces of logic that we've put in. Very simple to understand. You know, like one one thing says, okay, uh, you know, pull like connect this to logic that always uh, makes the pin zero or LED zero high. So right. uh, what it's doing right now here is that we uh, took the tool, we disabled the pin, and I'm uploading it right now, the repack binary which our tool did uh, through the GitHub link, and uh, it's gonna go ahead. And we wanna go. Can you reboot the router? So let's look at what was the integrity status. Again, this is on pre Ramon. We have full access now. FPGA cannot do anything. And here it is. We have updated the FPGA. It's still booted. You cannot apply any more patch. I have 20 SPI flashes right now on my. So I have to like literally take it out, update it. Like this and is really the, come on, it's guys. Very good. Like this is really cool though. <laughs> right? So. Now we've left the output right of this thing saying that something is wrong right in Raman so we can demonstrate prove that okay so the FPGA is doing its job it just physically can't reset that processor and now we can actually patch Raman and pre Raman to make this little message go away right so but for the purpose of the demo you know we're showing that this thing is trying to cry out for help but no one is coming. And we're we gonna went. wait 100 seconds also while they show the other demo. Uh, so as you can see, uh, there were four lights before and we have disabled the one light which was on the, uh, at the end. So again, try it out, play with it and uh, what we want Yeah and the reason why we use the Mojo is that you know this is a very inexpensive uh, piece of hardware that has you know the, the Spartan FPGA inside. So uh, if you take a look at our tool, right, you should be able to you know modify this yourself and play with all of the different options of taking you know pin high, pin low, input to output and all of that good stuff. So, you know, I think we're uh, about out of time. Yeah, so this is the impact. Well, to right. Cisco routers are used a lot in a lot of places. Um, but, <laughs> so we do make a lot of recommendations uh, and a lot more detail on the technical side of all of this and the implications of other things that's not just a Cisco router, right, in our, in our paper which is coming out in, in a day I think or two days uh, at Usenix Woot. So, you know, we don't have time to talk about all of our recommendations that we have for uh, you know, improving FPGA security, right? Uh, making it as, as good as it can because fundamentally this is something that is stuck in hardware and I don't believe that this is something that can actually be fixed via a software patch. So please check out our website, uh, our code on GitHub, read our paper, read the fucking paper, right? And um, there are 20 more slides. You guys can look at it later. Uh, on. I don't know. I think we're getting kicked out. Oh, in order to reward you guys for for coming to the right talk, I'm going to throw out some T-shirts. I mean, who, who else is doing that, right? There you go. You guys made the right decision in life and you get awarded for it. Yay. So, all right. Well, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, that's our talk.